following interview of Katherine Jones was conducted by the students of Florida State University College of Law's Children in Prison Project. At 13 years old, Catherine became one of the youngest children in the country to be charged as an adult for first-degree murder. Catherine is now a mom of two and the co-director of Outreach and Partnership Development at the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. She has used her experiences to become a voice for change and she agreed to speak with us about her time in prison, specifically her time spent in solitary confinement. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll get started where it all started. Just tell us a little bit about your backstory and why you were placed in adult prison. Um, I was 13 years old when I was um, charged and convicted of second degree murder of my stepmother. Um, me and my brother were 12 and 13 and had the unfortunate um, distinction of being the youngest people to be charged and sentenced to adult prison. And at 13, I think I made a 13-year-old immature decision to get myself out of a um, traumatic environment. Um, we had gone to DCF and reported sexual abuse by our father's brother, our uncle. Um, nothing happened. Found the indicators of abuse and simply told um, my dad that he wasn't allowed around us anymore. Um, he did, in fact, Come back into the home at the time I did not know that my brother was also being sexually abused so um DHS came into the investigation I retracted my statement out of fear of being put into foster care which I had already experienced when I was younger when my mom um kidnapped me and my brother um in a custody battle and we were placed in foster care after they arrested her until they my dad came and got us and it was a horrible experience so um, the only alternative that they gave us during the DHS interview was that if it was happening, that they would take us out of the home and place us in foster care. So I retracted the statement, considered it the lesser of two evils. Um, I made up in my mind that I was going to get me and my brother out of the situation at any at all cost. And I can't tell you where it came from. Came up with the idea just to kill everybody in the house. Um, and just run away with my brother. And of course, that was a 13 year old mentality. We knew that that's not going to happen like that. And we were charged with murder. How many years did you guys end up being convicted to adult prison? Um, we were sentenced to 18 years, followed by a lifetime of supervision, but served um, 16 years and eight months of that sentence. Of the 16 years and eight months, how much of that time was spent in solitary? Um, I would average it out about five years. There was um, probably 15 months initially between the county and when we first went to prison with a brief break for um, to be sent to a juvenile program, which in its way was its own type of isolation because it was minimum security. And I had an 18 year sentence, so I had to um, be treated different than other people. I couldn't go outside to recreation. I could not go to the dining room because you had to go outside into another building. And um, I was there for about seven months before I was transferred back to um, an adult prison and where I was put in solitary confinement again while they tried to figure out what to do with me because I was so young. And um, I was finally released at around the age of 16. And I had become so adapted to it that whenever it just became too much for me, I just put myself right back in there for disciplinary infractions. So um, on and off for about five years, if we totaled it all up. How do you think being a person of color impacted your experience in solitary confinement? Did you ever notice any racial disparity in who was placed in solitary versus who wasn't? Of course, there are more um, black children that are sent to adult prison than white children. That's uh, the statistics. And so, of course, there's more blacks inside solitary confinement than there are um, white um, offenders because the same that holds true um, out here in society, if you were Black, you were considered more aggressive. 
um, more mature. You were held accountable and, and your expectations were higher. Um, you were treated more harshly when you were sentenced at disciplinary hearings. Um, uh, the white girls were typically given less sentences or not even sent to disciplinary confinement, given probation or other alternatives to disciplinary confinement, whereas my Black peers were typically sentenced to long terms of solitary confinement for the exact same infraction. And your experience lines up with a lot of the statistics that we've found on solitary confinement for people of color. So I think it would be beneficial if you could kind of paint a picture for us of what it was like in solitary confinement. Can you describe what you saw and what you heard while you were in the cell? Well, you're inside of like a a six by nine or six by 12 cell, depending on what wing you were on. Um, I was initially housed in what they called the blacktop. Um, they had a tar roof and there was absolutely no ventilation inside of there. It would get so hot inside of the confinement cell that we would dip our sheets in the toilets and wring it out and lay them on top of us um, to try to cool down, to get our body temperatures down. There were constant medical emergencies for people that brought heat exhaustion. Um, it was just, it was inhumane. If a dog was placed in that type of environment, you would go to jail. Did you hear other girls that were also placed in solitary or other women while you were in, in one of the cells? Yes. We were, um, when I first went, I was by myself because I was considered administrative confinement, but administrative and disciplinary confinement were housed together. And there wasn't really a difference in how we were treated. Um, or what privileges we received. And so we it was against the rules for us to, to speak to each other, to yell out of our doors. But um, of course we did because it's just, um, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect someone to, to sit in silence for um, sometimes as long as six months in solitary confinement. Were there times where you got in trouble or got punished for communicating with the other girls? Yeah, we would um, get in trouble for either like writing little notes and trying to slide them down the wing so that they wouldn't hear us yelling. We would just write back and forth. And if they came on the wing and caught us, we would um, receive another disciplinary infraction. The same for yelling. If we were yelling back and forth, if they um, could identify in the, the the horrible part of it was because they could identify the voices. Sometimes they would just choose one of us to make an example and write a disciplinary report for yelling, even though technically they couldn't prove it was you. And so there were people that received enhanced disciplinary consequences for stuff that they didn't do as an example to all the other um, inmates that were on the wing. So there was no burden or proof for anything that had to be met? No, it's not like going to court outside. Um, a disciplinary uh, hearing was um, just as unfair and unjust as most of the criminal proceedings that happen out here. We, um, if it was an officer, who, because lieutenants typically sat on a disciplinary hearing with a sergeant, and if an officer wrote you up and they were friends with that lieutenant or sergeant, um, they weren't going to take your word over theirs, and they were going to take whatever recommendation that staff member gave, even though they technically were not supposed to be involved in the sentencing phase of the disciplinary process. Um, it was just, it was rigged like that. It was a good old boy system. How do officers get placed on the solitary unit? Um, typically, the officers that were in this, the confinement unit were ones who were under type of a review that had received a lot of complaints. Um, for mistreating um, the incarcerated females. Um, there were officers that had um, pending um, domestic violence charges with their wives, um, pending um, DUI convictions that hadn't been found guilty yet. So any type of review that caused them to be in trouble or on some type of probationary period, they were typically put in, um, inside the confinement cells. Or officers that were notorious for um, just being very harsh with um, the people housed there. Earlier on in the interview, you mentioned that you witnessed different medical emergencies while you were in solitary confinement. Can you explain some of those to us and how they were dealt with in the system? There were medical emergencies caused by the heat, like heat exhaustion. People would get nauseous. They would faint. Um 
chills, just the regular symptoms of heat exhaustion. And most of the time they either felt like the person was faking or that it wasn't that serious. And um, the same with psychological medical emergencies where there were women who would hang themselves. Um, that was one of my first memories of being in solitary confinement. I wasn't even there a month when a girl house next to me hung herself. And um, we were screaming and asking them to get on the wing that she's hanging. And, you know, they were in the, the staff section congregating, eating um, what they normally did instead of doing the 15 minute checks. And finally, we made enough noise where they came. And by then it was almost too late and she had to be resuscitated. How does the normal prison process look for responding to suicidal tendencies or psychological emergencies? Um, if they if they survived, um, they would typically be stripped of all of their clothes and placed in an isolation cell. Um, we could we call that a crisis unit, or the we called them SOS. Um, those of us that were in the directly impacted community, um, and they were given their meals just like confinement, um, without utensils um, or anything. And they didn't have blankets. They didn't have sheets. Um, at a certain time at night, I think it was from 10 to 5, they would give them a blanket. They were constantly checked on around the clock. Um, so it was almost like you were punished for being suicidal. I, there, was, there was a blatant disregard for human life by the guards because it wasn't, it was just like another one bites the dust if they didn't make it. And if, you know, they did, they were ridiculed for being suicidal, um, they would pick on them or they were considered like the weak links, the ones who couldn't make it. So um, yeah, mental health was not something that was a high priority inside the prison. Was your ability to see your family and have visitors affected by your placement in solitary confinement compared to the general population? Well, when I first came, I didn't really know about visitation. I didn't know um, anything about phone calls. I didn't know my family's phone numbers by heart. They took all of my property. So when I first went to solitary confinement, I lost all communication with the outside world. And I went in October and it wasn't until around Christmas, um, the officer came to my door and told me I had a visitor. And I was surprised because I hadn't done any type of visitation form. I didn't do anything and I don't know, my dad must have called and said, and they made an exception. And um, they called me up to the visitation room and they took me into an isolated room um, that was separate from the common visitation area. It was like a conference room with me and my dad and we weren't able to go and buy food or drinks or anything during the um, six hour visitation period because I wasn't allowed to go and I couldn't be left in alone. So. Um, my visitation was a lot different than the other um, people that were there. And I spoke to a captain after that and um, about how the visitation went. And he made accommodations for my dad to be able to, prior to coming in to visit me, to be able to stop in the general population visitation, buy food, and then bring it into the conference room with me. Do you think the fact that your access to visitors was limited while in solitary had any impact on your mental health? Oh, absolutely. I mean, at 13, you're supposed to be being nurtured and you're learning your social skills. And um, all of that was hindered because I was placed in solitary confinement at a time when I think I needed family support more than anything, um, mental health support more than I probably ever would in my life, considering that I had just taken another human being's life. And I had no way to process that than to sit in the cell and be consumed with um, guilt and remorse and not really know how to channel that. Um, my placement in solitary confinement um, made it a lot harder for me once I came out to deal with my emotions or any type of conflict. And I just did what I learned to do in their survive, which was kind of internalized and stay silent and just deal with it. How else was life in solitary confinement different from life in general population? Were your meals different? They were served cold. Um, once again, that was something that was considered a punishment if the wing was particularly loud or if there was someone misbehaving. 
Um, they would hold our meals for as long as they possibly could before they served them. But um, even if we did get them on time, as soon as they got there, our meals were typically prepared before count time and they were not sent to us um, from the kitchen, which was quite a bit of ways away until after count time. So I did not have a hot meal until I was out of confinement. And um, because I did not know about the canteen or that there even was a store, mm -hmm. I didn't know that um, I was able to order um, additional food, but had I even known, I wouldn't have had the funds to do so because I didn't have any contact with my family. So I was really restricted to the three meals that they served us. Um, and I ate them because I had no choice. Um, I didn't have any other alternatives. And what about different services? So you were 13, you should have been in probably around eighth grade. Were you receiving any sort of education while you were in solitary? No, I, they had not made any type of accommodations. It was um, very now looking in hindsight, so ironic that um, the system felt that um, I deserved to be treated as an adult. They did not have any idea how to do that at the time. Um, I was not, I did not receive any type of education until I came back to prison the second time. Um, and was released into population and placed in the youthful offender program. But while I was in confinement, there was no um, no type of accommodations made for me to receive an education. It wasn't until I was almost released from confinement that I knew that I could get library books and was able to learn how to order um, two library books a week that I typically read seven or eight times because when you have all day in a cell, two books last you a few hours at best. Um, I then learned to get bigger books, whether I was interested in them or not, because it gave me something to do. Um, so education was non-existent until I was released. During this time that you were in solitary confinement, did you ever think about the victim of the crime? Um, every single day, every night. Um, I had a picture that was sent to me of her, and I used to feel like, um, her eyes would follow me. I had a really, really bad nightmares um, replaying the day that it happened. Um, the longer um, I sat in solitary, the more real it became. I began to really understand the eternal consequences of what I did. They placed me on a large amount of psychotropics to deal with that instead of counseling. Um, I learned later that the medications that I I had were not meant to be mixed um, and that the levels um, that they gave me were would have been considered an overdose. I literally could not function without the medication. And when I did start refusing to take the medication, I went through withdrawals, similar to what I've seen people go through off of heroin and cocaine when I was in the medical wing uh, when they came in the county jail. Um, so much so that I had called my family and told them that I wasn't going to make it out. Wow. So it really sounds like you did not have the resources to get through this time that I think would be difficult for anyone, but especially as a 13 year old, um, there was no therapy or counseling available to you. No, it wasn't until there were only three or four um, counselors and there were probably 1500 women. And um, once I learned that I could be put on the list and I wrote a request to be put on the list to be seen, I wasn't seen that often or that regularly for to create some type of bond with that. I was just another case file um, to check off that I had been to mental health. Um, I do remember her name, Miss Oates, because I, there was a, you know, a very profound moment where I had gone to confinement for fighting, which was a norm for me. Um, and she told me, if you are in your 20s and you are fighting when people offend you or if your feelings are hurt, like you should check your maturity level. And that resonated with me. And I and I, I didn't fight again after that. It was just like, oh, there's another way to deal with my emotions besides lashing out. And um, so there was some good that came out of it, but um, I wish I could have seen her more because I had to come home and deal with a lot of things that I should have been able to deal with. I feel like there are a lot of stories in the news about corrections officers mistreating inmates. What was your relationship like with the guards? Did you experience any of this mistreatment? 
I'm one of many women that were in solitary confinement that have the unfortunate story of being sexually assaulted by a guard while in there. Um, I had a male officer. I was either 15 or 16. Um, he came to give me my food tray, um, reached in, started groping my breast. Um, I had been through sexual abuse as long as I could remember. It was the reason why I was in prison. And I was um, determined not to, to let it go, that I was going to say something this time. And I reported it to a sergeant. Um, I remember um, Captain Seek, who was really, really nice to me because she used to leave my light on at night um, so that I didn't have to be afraid of the roaches. And um, so when she came in, I told her what happened and she immediately filed a report. You know, for the first time in my life, I felt like, you know, someone believed me. She didn't hesitate. Um, so I went to the inspector's office feeling like there was going to be some type of um, justice. And um, unfortunately learned that um, the officer who committed the um, assault was a friend of the inspector, his golf, bus, his golf buddy, actually. And he advised me that he was Italian and Italians were touchy-feely. I probably misinterpreted that. And so he gave me a sheet of paper and um, told me that I could write that I had misinterpreted interpreted it or I could stick to my original statement, which was that it was an inappropriate touch. <laughs> and then he would keep me in confinement to protect me. Um, I had been in solitary confinement for quite a bit of time then. And finally they were offering me the chance to get out, be released into population. Um, unless of course I was afraid of the officer that committed the assault. So I wrote the statement. Um, said I misinterpreted it, and um, and I, I I hate that I did that, but you know, once again, it's all in hindsight because as an adult, I should have stuck with my guns and didn't care about the consequences. But as a kid, all I wanted to do was be out of that hellhole of a box they were keeping me in. I am sorry, there seems to be a bug in my house. I give me one moment. I'm going to save the day. <laughs> wow, you are truly a super mom. How does your experience compare to that of others? Would you say it's the norm for individuals to be silenced when they try to come forward with complaints of sexual assault? Um, it was kind of a unspoken. I don't even want to say we just knew not to say anything. We knew not to bring a complaint. We knew what the consequences would be. We knew if we complained against staff for the sake of what they were giving protection, we would be placed inside solitary confinement. Um, all of the consequences would fall on the person who made the allegation, the one who was victimized or assaulted. Um, it was pretty much unheard of. I don't think a single correction officer was fired for sexual misconduct in the 16 years and eight months that I was in prison. In hindsight, do you think that being sexually assaulted while in prison affected your healing process from the sexual abuse that you experienced as a child? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I think it um, reinforced the belief that, um, that I wasn't worthy of respect, um, that um, people could do things with no consequences. That um, kind of like the, I don't know the exact stats, but it was like, like if you have ever been a victim of sexual assault, it's like you have a target for some reason that you, it's just people that are predators, like, no. <laughs> and I, and I thought something was just like wrong with me. Like, um, you know, that was the first of you know, many experiences I had like that while I was incarcerated. It was like, why me? Why me? What am I doing wrong? What is it the way I walk? Is it the way I dress? Is it the way I act that says, um, please violate me? And so um, it wasn't until I'm, I want to say the last year or two when I had a daughter that I really hardcore started working on some of those um, misguided beliefs, <laughs> those incorrect 
theories because I wanted to be healed so that I could make sure she was raised whole. Thank you for sharing something that I'm sure thousands of women can relate to and putting amazing words to it. The mistreatment you've described sounds incredibly draining emotionally, mentally, physically. In fact, research has shown that of the suicides that occur in prison, over half of them occur while the inmate is in solitary confinement. Did you ever experience suicidal thoughts? I don't ever remember particularly being suicidal, but I know I felt like I was hopeless. It seemed like I was never getting out of there. There wasn't an end in sight. I didn't have anything like to occupy my time to feel like I was being productive or working towards preparing for my release at the beginning. Um, I didn't have the ability to equip myself with the resources I needed to be emotionally healthy. I really became a product of my environment. I, I adapted to being in isolation. Um, I adopted that defiant um, disregard for authority um, after seeing how the guards treated us when we were in confinement. They treated us worse than people would treat animals. And so it created a, a very strong dislike for guards and authority um, because almost everyone I've seen, with the exception of a few, completely um, abused that authority and used it to, to mistreat us. There was nothing good that came out of my, my personality while I was in solitary confinement. I can't think of one aspect of it that helped me grow as a person. I think one case that's obviously been in the news and is a huge example of that is Cleef Browder. And a lot of his videos he spoke to while being in, inside the racing thoughts he experienced, the internal stimuli that he missed out on, and other mental health problems that he had experienced. When being alone with your thoughts, are there any like specific psychological effects that you can remember or think that happened to you or others? When you don't have anyone there to um, redirect a negative train of thought, it only spirals out of control and it gets worse. Um, one of the emotions that I felt strongly that manifested in so many negative ways in my life was guilt. And there was no one there that said, you know, you were a child. The only thing I had heard during my court process, during my intake, during my incarceration. I was never a child or a kid anymore. You know, I was a murderer. I was the killer. I was it. So those labels began to chip away at my identity. I wasn't called by name anymore when I went to prison. I was now a number. So when you're by yourself and you don't have any influence to remind you of who you really are, you become exactly how people see you, especially at 13 years old when I haven't even developed my identity yet. Um, I'm now what the guards are calling me. I'm now what I read in the newspapers. And that uh, being in solitary confinement intensifies that because I'm alone in a room with all of those thoughts bombarding me constantly. And I suffered for that for um, over 10 years. And even now there's still some residual um, effects of that where um, even when I started working at the campaign feeling some type of imposter syndrome like I didn't deserve to be where I was or be doing what I'm doing and all of that is a direct result of what I experienced in solitary confinement. We have dedicated this video to Kasha Spencer whose story directly relates to the topic of suicide. Since you knew Kasha could you tell us a little bit about her and your relationship with her? Kasha Spencer was my roommate inside the youthful offender dormitory um, when she went to confinement where she committed suicide. And she was so close to home and so full of hope because she had just reunited and reconnected with some of her family. Um, and I remember talking at length with her about that because um, I wasn't connected with my mom. And, and, you know, she tried to be encouraging to me. And just one of the sweetest people that I've ever met, one of my first friends, in the youthful offender door. And I remember her going to confinement and 
it was the first time that suicide really hit home. The first time that I knew that someone that actually died from suicide, but she was trying to get away from Lowell to go to Broward. And it wasn't like she truly wanted to kill herself. Um, she tied the sheet up uh, from what we heard from the guards and her neck snapped. And there wasn't a, a very swift response time, but I remember waking up the next morning, we're all getting ready to go to work and they won't let us out. And we're like in a continual master count. And that's when I learned that that's what happens when somebody dies. Then when, you know, one of my sisters there didn't make it. And when we heard it was cautious, there was just like a grieving that went over the youthful offender camp and all we had was each other to deal with it. You know, it wasn't like out here where well, here at school that happens. They send guidance counselors. It was just us trying to process how this could have happened. And um, I can't think of anything more tragic. Had solitary confinement not been an option for a youthful offender, um, Kasha would still be here because she really didn't do anything that deserved solitary confinement. So it was a tragic loss, um, not just for her family, but for all of us that shared space with her inside of the youthful family. That's why this legislative advocacy is so important because of all the future cautious that could be saved that are currently dealing with the atrocities you and Kasha faced within solitary confinement. Um, so thank you for sharing her story. Earlier you said, and I really do think this is um, important to repeat, that while in solitary, you become a product of your environment. Something else you've discussed previously is the fact that you and the other women would make animal noises and bang on the door and things like that in order to communicate with each other. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I can't really say it was kind of a norm to... Um, like how, and that was like our calls to each other. Um, I remember getting so frustrated and so hot in there one time. I just kind of like grabbed the bars and just were shaking them and screaming it. And I know if I was like outside looking in at that kind of behavior, I would think that I was like deranged or crazy, but the conditions like, cultivated that sense of that like this that animalistic nature that's inside of us um because you're being treated as subhuman you're being treated like you like there's no value on your life um and so you typically when we did call each other there was like a wolf call that we all did or a, um a bird call and that was how we communicated with each other uh, until you asked that question, I didn't even like directly relate that to the confinement experience because I don't think any of us that weren't in confinement did that. It was just those of us that were in solitary confinement. You have built a beautiful life for yourself. You're a mom of two, an advocate with the campaign for fair sentencing for youth. How did you overcome what you experienced in solitary confinement in order to get to where you are today? Um, it wasn't until I came in touch with Pastor Charles and his amazing wife. Um, I call her my Betty or my mentors that um, I was so hard and callous, it wouldn't cry. Um, and they kind of seen through that and seen my potential, seen where my giftings were, um, that people looked up to me and listened to me. And they, they helped me tap back into who I was before all of those labels came. And I, I don't, it wasn't an overnight. It, I'm still becoming, but there's still, Things that residual effects that I experienced, I am petrified of the dark um, as well as insects. Um, they were both used as like torture mechanisms when I was, you know, 13 in confinement. Um, I don't like um, silence when I'm sleeping. I've, I've got used to hearing people yell and scream, so I have to have me on when I'm sleeping. Um, and I'm sure if I was to really think about a lot of the um, negative things that I still deal with, there's probably it's probably rooted in solitary confinement in that experience because it was traumatizing and it was long lasting. And for years, um, it was really hard for me to let other people in my circle 
um, to, to express my emotions because I got so used to dealing with everything on my own. And um, I started to like that solitude. I embraced it. Well, I have to say, I know you mentioned that insects were used kind of as a torture device and that there were some pretty big cockroach issues in solitary confinement. You really are super mom because I know about 15 minutes ago, you went and killed a bug for your kids. <laughs> yeah, it's the only time you will ever see me. I remember my daughter being in the infant seat and a spider was crawling on her and had got on her car seat somehow. Um and I see, and I grabbed it with my bare hands. And prior to that, I was petrified of spiders. Something about being a mom brings out the like the superhuman. <laughs> Absolutely. Most people who experience the trauma associated with solitary confinement are unable to come out on the other side and thrive the way that you have. Uh, we discussed the example of Khalif Browder earlier, and that seems to be more of the norm for individuals subjected to this kind of psychological torture. Do you know how any of the other women who went through solitary confinement with you are doing today? The truth is I became who I am today in spite of my experience in solitary confinement, not because of solitary confinement, because the truth is um, most people that experience that will not receive the support that I did to help me digest and process the trauma of being in solitary confinement. I was one of the few fortunate ones that had a support system to help me deal with that. Um, most people don't. Most people don't even realize that they are even traumatized by their solitary confinement experiences and um, their actions are manifestations of that, whether it's reoffending, whether it's having unhealthy relationships with other people, unhealthy relationships with themselves, substance abuse, because you never learn how to cope. And so when you come out here and there's even more crap being thrown at you than what you experience in there, when you have the pressures of jobs and trying to find housing and taking care of family and reintegrating with your family, typically they, they turn to substance abuse. And so um, who I am today isn't because of that experience. And uh, that I, I believe and, and know that wholeheartedly. Um, I defy solitary confinement to become who I am. Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. We covered a lot of really difficult subjects, and I know that it couldn't have been easy to bring all of this back up, but the work you're doing is so incredibly important, and we really appreciate it. We wanted to end this discussion by posing the following question. If you were to give lawmakers one reason why solitary confinement for children should be abolished, what would that reason be? As long as it's considered illegal and inhumane to keep a dog inside of a locked car, it should be illegal and inhumane to keep a child inside of a box. 